So the past few years I've taken to studying uh, physics, really just for fun, uh, mostly astrophysics and quantum physics. Uh, and there is one thing that I deeply admire about physicists, and that is they're not at all ashamed to admit when they've made a mistake. Not only are they not ashamed, they're almost gleeful about declaring that they've made a mistake and everyone before them was wrong. Um, so as an example, um, in the beginning of any decent astrophysics textbook, it'll have a prologue that begins, once upon a time, we believed that the Earth was flat, and boy, were we wrong. Or, once upon a time, we believed that the sun rotated around the Earth, and boy, were we wrong. If you read a quantum physics textbook, pretty much the entire book is dedicated to demonstrating how classical physics is wrong from beginning to end. So I think it's kind of a shame that computer science textbooks don't start the same way. Uh, once upon a time, we believed that all software would be statically compiled. Boy, were we wrong. Once upon a time, we believed that 64K of RAM was a lot of memory. Oh, were we wrong. Once upon a time, we believed that all execution would be single-threaded in a single process on a single machine. And boy, were we wrong. So, so, so very wrong. Um, so, I'm a bit of a Udix graybeard. Uh, I may not look it, but I promise you, deep inside I am. And I have to confess, I have a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction when I see words like cloud or web 2.0. So I'm going to take a step back, sort of use the Wayback Machine, and let's sort of debunk some myths and see what we're really dealing with here. So the essence of cloud technology is networked computing, all right? This goes back to the 1950s. The first set of networked computers was SAGE, the semi-automatic ground network. It was a military installation for aggregating radar data in order to observe a large swath of the sky at once and detect threats. Going a little further, we have uh, a few incremental refinements. We get ARPANET, the first packet switching network. Uh, and also in that same decades, decade, we have the beginning of virtualization. So virtualization being the idea that you can have a single physical machine that pretends that it's multiple different machines on top, called virtual machines. So it presents the, the appearance of being more than one physical machine. TCPIP, 1970s. This was a standardized protocol for formatting, transmitting, and receiving data packets. Again, just another very, very, very simple refinement over what was there before, but an important refinement. And in the 80s, roundabout, we started calling it the internet. So this was one big network built on TCP IP. In the 90s, we called it the web. So it's still the same internet. There's not really much change. The big difference for the web, the World Wide Web, was just that there was now content that more than just a small group of technical users cared about. That's the big difference. So the internet by itself, TCP IP, ARPANET, SAGE, this is all just plumbing. When you start adding content that individual users actually care about, then it becomes a big deal. Then it takes off. In the 2000s, for no apparent reason, we had to change the name again and call it Web 2.0. It's still HTML, it's still CSS, it's still JavaScript. Um, there is a slight difference in the sense that people had a, a, a like in, in, the, in the 90s, it was sort of like mostly static content. In the 2000s, there was a sense that things were dynamic, that you should be able to go to a page and do more than just click a text link and see another page. Um, it should have dynamic behavior. So eh, maybe it's kind of worth a, a new name. In this decade, we call it the cloud. So again, this is the same technology, right? You've got your web servers, you've got your HTML, you've got your CSS, you've got your JavaScript. But there is a slight difference, and that is a deployment abstraction. So, you know, in, in 
the 2000s, virtualization started to become big for deploying web services. Um, it, Zen and KVM and you know, those sorts of projects. But the level of abstraction was kind of, it, it really handled it well if you had, say, 10 VMs, maybe on 20 servers, maybe as much as 100 servers if you were really, really pushing it. But it was a pain to manage. Um, so the idea behind the cloud is you may have 100 VMs, each running on 1,000 servers or 100,000 servers. Um, and because you're getting to that scale, then you start needing tools with a slightly higher level of, of abstraction to simplify that, that management process. But it really is just an infrastructure change. It's a very low level plumbing change. And most of the technology is still exactly the same. So what comes next? Here's the big question. So I've made up a word because I can. I'm a linguist, I can do that. Uh, ubique, so it's pronounced like unique. And it comes from the same Latin root as ubiquitous computing. But it's a lot easier to say. So the basic idea, uh, this Latin root just means everywhere. The idea is that you have computing everywhere. So what the cloud does is it slices your computing power up. Instead of having a large server or very large installation of servers that's a very manual process to create a new one, you now have very tiny slices of computing power and it's very easy to spin up as many more of them as you need on demand. Now, there are hints of the future, uh, and in much the same way that in every decade previously, you saw the beginnings of the next decade before it fully became fully formed. So the hints of Ubique are the Internet of Things, um, the idea of a large number of tiny things, say your refrigerator, your toaster, whatever, your plant water that have a connection to the Internet and have behavior, networked behavior because of that. Uh, smartphones are another good example where you hold in your hand computing power that's equivalent to a Cray supercomputer back in the day. You know, that's really a lot of power you're carrying in that tiny little device. And not only that, you know, so you don't have gigabit internet all over the world, certainly. Um, I have it in my apartment, which is awesome. But, but anywhere in the world you go, anywhere, with some exceptions, but Say, say like 90% of the world, you can at least get a data sim. You know, may not give you a, a high speed connection, but you are in some way networked to the rest of the world. Google Glass is not a great example. It's a pretty painful prototype, but it does begin to give you a hint of what it might be like to have computing power with you anywhere. A Fitbit is another example. It's just a tiny device that takes some stats on your activity and then feeds that into a cloud aggregated data that sort of gives you a report on how fit you are. So this is the interesting thing about the cloud. The cloud itself is just deployment abstraction. It's just plumbing. It's not really all that exciting to most of the world. It's really exciting to like big companies who need to save money on deployment costs. Um, and it's exciting to those of us who enjoy working on like compilers and web servers and low level details. But to most of the rest of the world, they don't even notice it. Um, so it's kind of the same as the internet. The internet was launched and nobody cared because there was no reason they should care. What changes that is when like mass numbers of even non-technical human beings have a reason to use it. So internet is plumbing, web is mass adoption. Cloud is plumbing, uh, ubiquitous computing, the internet of things is mass adoption. It's the next phase. So here's a projection by Gartner uh, based on growth rates. Um, and that is, the, so the current total number of internet connected devices in the world is just under 5 billion. If growth rates continue as they have done in the past few years, and all signs show that they will, uh, the, the total number of connected devices, including you know, laptops, smartphones, tablets, and all the internet of things devices is going to be 30 billion. 
So this is very, very big business. This is big business for all the people who make those tiny little devices, but it's also big business for projects like Apache. Uh, because you make the plumbing that makes it happen. Do you care? Should you care? So here's the deal, right? Apache is web. Web is a cloud. Apache is cloud. And I'm not just talking about cloud stack. I'm talking about every single bit, every single project in Apache is web related in one way or another. So here's a little few, a few stats, largely because this data is easy to get and data on some of the other projects inside Apache are not as easy to get. So HTTPD uh, measured this month uh, on the top 10 million sites in the world uh, comprises 60% of web servers. Nginx is 20%. IIS is 14%, and from there you drop down to like the 2% and below, which are much smaller. If you take a look about four years ago, HTTPD was a little bit higher at 71%. Um, at the time, IIS was 20%, and Nginx was only 4%. So you can see a slight trend, uh, but a lot of it is Nginx stealing from IIS and a little bit from Apache. Even so, with a slight decline, 60% is a massive share of the market. Absolutely massive. Like, Apache HTTPD owns the web. You know, we're talking like three times higher than the closest competitor. Okay, so then you have to take a step back and think, why is Apache so successful? There's a few reasons. Uh, most of them boil down to being free software. So there's kind of two parts to that. One part of being free software is the Apache way, right? So it's the way that Apache goes about creating software uh, to get the best possible input from the widest set of people. Uh, it's about having access to the software. People can just go grab it. They don't have to like make a big business contract and you know get approval for like a big expenditure, they can just grab it, start prototyping, play with it, and run with it, and then over time, well, of course, we'll deploy with it also. Uh, so there's a very low barrier for entry. The Apache license is, is a very big part of, of Apache's success. Um, it's, it's a license that allows a very broad array of uses. Uh, so just about any business that wants to build something on top of Apache, the license is not an obstacle. And at the same time, it promotes those same businesses feeding back into the Apache projects and improving the Apache projects that they're benefiting from. Collaboration is a big part of it. So that's, that's both the idea that um, the more people you have looking at the software, the more likely they are to find and fix the problems. It makes for very, very stable software. And also the fact that the more people you have contributing, the faster you can fix any problems as they come up and the faster you can improve the whole body of software. It's the way that Apache goes about bringing new projects into the fold and helping them come up to speed and understand what the Apache way is all about and how they can get the best benefit out of it. It really is a jump start for a new project that might make hundreds of, of mistakes if they were left on their own to kind of struggle through. But the fact that they have that guidance of those who've gone before, it saves them an enormous amount of time and pain and cost. And all of this kind of comes together in making it easier to innovate, making it easier to bring in new features, to bring in new ideas, and keep adapting for the future. So it makes for a very stable, stable layer in order to build the rest of the web on top of, um, which is what you want from your plumbing. You want stable, reliable, steady foundations. And it comes from a sense that creating value is more important than extracting value. Um, there, are, there are various different theories around, around models of innovation, of models of productivity. And over and over again in free software, we come back to the fact that the best way to succeed is by creating more value than your competitors, not by squashing them. 
So there's another side to free software. Um, and it's also important, although I would say much less important, and that is free software costs nothing. Um, so when you get into a cloud space, when you're talking about running like hundreds of thousands of instances of a web server, um, the idea of paying a license fee for each instance of that web server is absolutely insane. It would crush most businesses before they could get off the ground. Um, so in fact, it is a competitive advantage to be free and to gain your value in other ways. So the business models that free software has known for a long time and more and more companies are beginning to get now are to sell support, um, sell services, and selling content back again to the World Wide Web. That's what people are willing to pay for, and that's what puts the cost on the consumers uh, instead of trying to, instead of crushing the business before it can even get started. So if this is the case, then what's the future? Well, if you look at cloud architectures, the biggest thing they demand, again, because of the scale, is software that's smaller, lighter, and faster. Um, so I'm, again, Unix Graybeard here. Um, I remember a time when Mod Perl was really exciting because you could load all of your modules into memory at once and it improved performance because everything was loaded in memory at once. If you go out and start looking around for help on Apache now, what you'll see is lots and lots of tips on how to not load mod PHP so you can avoid the pre-fork NPM and use the worker NPM and save an enormous amount of memory because you're not loading everything into memory at once. It's like complete opposite. Um, everything coming from full circle in a way. Or you'll see talk about using the event NPM to get to handle workloads like Nginx is sort of popular for. Um, the same sort of very light, fast, uh, very low memory, low consumption workloads. So there's no, tr there's no trouble at all adapting to the new model. In fact, I'd say Apache already has. Um, it's just something to keep in mind as the future keeps marching forward. So if you're interested in helping, Apache is web, web is cloud, Apache is cloud, what should you do? Um, honestly, just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. I have no complaints whatsoever. Keep up. Keep maintaining this, the, the software that you have. Um, and that's both bug fixes and um, just being responsive to the needs of the users. Um, keep adding new features. As you see a demand in the market, keep adding new features, shifting the features you have. Just keep growing and changing. Make sure if you are an expert in an area that you are teaching at least two other people how to do that. Um, because you won't be around forever. And as needs grow, you will need more people to do it even right now. So make sure you teach other people. Make sure you yourself keep learning. Even if you feel like you're an expert in one domain, learn more about other Apache projects. Learn more about projects that are outside Apache entirely. Uh, learn the competitive advantages, learn what kinds of features you might need to adapt and improve. And make sure you don't forget the non-technical pieces of Apache. Uh, because if you focus only on technology, it's very easy to fracture and fall apart. Um, events like this and communi community building, the way you talk to each other on a mailing list, the way you build relationships with each other, that's what keeps Apache strong for a very, very long time into the future. Apache's been around for almost 20 years. All the signs say that it will be around for at least another 20 years. Um, so that means you kind of have to take a different perspective than you might have in the very early days. I don't know if anybody in 1995 was really thinking about what Apache would be 20 years into the future. Uh, but now you kind of have to. And it means what you're looking at is not just what should we, do, we be doing next year, but how do we make this project sustainable for the very, very long-term future. Thank you. <laughs>